to the Bankers China Under Trump video series. This is a video series that will look at different chapters focusing on different aspects of the Sino-American relations under the new incoming uh, U.S. presidential administration of Donald uh, Trump. Uh, today we'll be focusing on the green economy and clean energy investment. And to discuss this with me today, I'm joined by Mariana Mazzucato, who is the professor of economics at University of Sussex, but soon to be heading a new institute at UCL uh, on innovation and public purpose. Yes. So thank Thanks you very for inviting much. Inviting me. Thank you for coming. Um, so, Mariana, you have uh, written a book called The Entrepreneurial State, where you look at how uh, actually we could be debunking the myth that uh, the state is sort of the more inefficient or risk-averse uh, player when it comes to investing in innovation, uh, whereas the private sector is always seen as the most uh, you know, risk-prone and adventurous, I guess, economic actor uh, in an economy. In this same book, you also talk about how uh, China has uh, been uh, really a, a model almost in in terms of investing efficiently in the clean energy sector, um, in terms of uh, how China has been able to do this uh, and how it's also been very good at distributing uh, this type of investments, uh, how would you say it's uh, been so successful? Right. In the so, I mean, one of the key points in the book is that we really need to actually have a new narrative, a new understanding of how the state actually operates with innovation. And instead of thinking it, um, of it as a lender of last resort, we should think of it as an investor of first resort, and this is absolutely what China has done. They have a very large, for example, Chinese bank, the China Development Bank, which has actually provided the patient, long-term committed strategic capital, which innovative companies need in different sectors from IT to green. And what's really interesting in China, actually, is the degree, to, or I would say the question for China today, will be the degree to which it actually distributes these investments in innovation across a system, because it cannot be done top down. It can't be done by you know, one ministry or even one bank. So this is a big lesson we learned from the Soviet Union, which was spending a lot on research and development, had a very high, say, R&D to GDP ratio, but was growing less than Japan, because Japan had this more diffuse system of innovation across different types of institutions, which allowed this new knowledge, if you want, to diffuse across the economy. And today, there's different actors in China, but they're quite big actors. Um, and the Chinese bank, in particular, because it is an investment bank, is, of course, capturing the returns, as you mentioned, because it can retain equity, by definition, because it's an investment bank. But that's not the only way that innovation, of course, is occurring. They have a ministry of innovation. They have all sorts of different actors. And the real point, I think, that one should pay attention to is the degree to which, again, these investments are distributed across the whole innovation chain. Those countries that focus too much on, say, the science part, or too much on the finance part at the end, or too much on diffusion and deployment, don't sort of capture that whole spectrum of investments that innovation requires. And in terms of also the Chinese, the Chinese possibility to make this happen, some would argue that the fact that it remains one of the most powerful, I guess, autocratic governments in the world today allows it to have a lot of political muscle when it comes to implementing policy reform that is definitely needed when it comes to boosting, for example, the clean energy right. sector. It also means it probably has a firmer grip on the private sector versus other countries. Uh, would you agree with that statement? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, even in the U.S., where, of course, the government was absolutely central to its competitiveness in terms of innovation, right? So all the technologies in our iPhones that make iPhones smart were government funded. These actually occurred through different organizations, which were often related to security needs, so mm. Department of Defense. Increasingly also in Department of Energy, Department of Health. But the real, I think, way that different countries have sometimes been able to um, uh, get consensus, if you want, for the kinds of budgets that are needed are to frame the innovation needs around these you know, security questions. Now, whether it's military security, energy security, mm -hmm. and the word energy security often does come up, um, or even uh, increasingly health security. Um, and I'm not sure if I would necessarily say that it's you know the autocratic character of China that you know is 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 making it successful in green because of course there's many other autocratic countries that are not mm -hmm. doing this. So there's also this urgency because as we know these very high levels of pollution, but also the very uh, fast speed of development you know, from the countryside to the cities, which is really making the cities unbearable. Mm -hmm. And of course, there was different, um, you know, intellectuals in China that warned against the speed of development and also saying we cannot develop like the West has and not create a natural disaster on the planet. 
and that wasn't necessarily heated at the time, but today it is. I mean, there's real urgency in China about pollution. And in terms of the new actors you're saying could, mm -hmm. that could come into play, in addition to such a big entity like the China Development Bank, for instance, mm -hmm. what are the new actors that you are starting to identify in terms of coming into uh, this new push in terms of investing into the green economy? Um, well, first of all, it's, it's not just one bank, right? There's a whole distribution of different types of public banks, but there's also, I mean, one of the lead actors actually in China are the public utilities, mm -hmm. uh, but also the private companies, which are these state-owned companies, which have also been able to emerge, not just in green, but also in IT, because of these massive loans that they're getting. Um, you know, as, as much as we'd like to think that it's venture capital, which gives uh, finance to innovative companies, you know, they're very exit driven, three mm -hmm. to five years. What you really need is kind of 15 yeah. to 20 to 30 year long term, kinds commitment. Of long -term committed yeah. capital. And there's lots of these different types of patient financial institutions. They're distributed in China. If you uh, look at the Bloomberg New Energy Finance Database, which is probably the best database out there, uh, you really see a whole host of different types of um, public and semi-public private uh, financial institutions, but also state-owned companies and also, you know, in theory, private companies in China playing a very important role. But it's more their interactions, I think, that is going to be interesting mm -hmm. for the future to see how they do interact and, and again, how they uh, retain a wide portfolio of investments. What you don't want to do is put all your eggs in one basket. Uh, what's currently happening in the U.S. is lots of eggs in the fracking basket, mm -hmm. <laughs> which, by the way, was government financed as well through the DOE, at least initially. Uh, Tesla itself, which is obviously very important in terms of green innovation in the, in the U.S., would not have happened without a $465 million guaranteed loan, again, mm -hmm. from the U.S. government. So these kinds of distributed financing streams from the state, you know, we shouldn't just be thinking about China. This is, in fact, how it's occurred in many different countries. And, in fact, I mean, so far, uh, one could argue it also, also in terms of the geopolitical discourse on climate change or clean energy has historically, one could argue, been um, headed by the U.S. in uh, various circular forms. Yes. Now you have the incoming uh, President uh, Trump uh, that during the campaign has said things like climate change is a work of fiction or is pushing potentially to back away from the Pri Paris Climate Agreement. Yeah. First of all, how likely do you think this is actually going to happen? Was it merely campaign talk? Well, we shouldn't forget that talk like that, whether it happens or not, already starts to have an effect. So the actual agencies in the U.S., like the you know, Department of Energy and then the particular organizations funded, for example, by the Department of Energy, like ARPA-E, people in there start to get depressed <laughs> when they hear that kind of talk. So the kind of hemorrhaging of real talent, which, by the way, is one of the features of the Chinese government, that it's been able to attract real talent. You know, there's all this really interesting... Uh, uh, stories about the, if you want, extreme meritocracy also in the Chinese government. But in some ways that has also happened in the U.S. that when they had mission-oriented agencies, whether it was DARPA or ARPA-E, they, you know, attracted top thinkers. I mean, just think of the head of the DOE, a Nobel Prize winning physicist, Steve Chu, in the U.S. Now, would a Nobel Prize winning physicist want to direct a Department of Energy in a government that is so climate skeptic? The answer is, of course, not. And so when you start having this hemorrhaging of sort of the big brains from these actual organizations, that's one of the biggest dangers, as well as, of course, the, the possible cut. So it, it's, it's not that he's going to destroy these agencies, but he's already started to say, you know, well, hey, why are we, you know, investing in all these different areas? Why don't we just fund, for example, perhaps basic science? Mm -hmm. And even there, he's starting to be skeptical on why we have all this, you know, funding for basic research in the U.S. So as soon as you start thinking the state should be sort of, you know, should withdraw and just do, you know, fix a particular market failure without having a presence and actively shaping and creating a new market, you are no longer a leader. And we shouldn't forget that innovation, and this is really key, is characterized by what we call in economics dynamic returns to sta scale, so increasing returns to scale, learning economies. So actually being first and being a leader has huge effects. There's first come, you know, mover advantages. So as soon as the U.S. starts to fall behind, in the innovation race in green, it will stay behind. And it's very hard to catch up later. Exactly. So would it be fair to say that not only, you, I guess we could see, we could envision a situation where the U.S. starts falling behind. China has obviously proven that it's moving very fast. It has arguably caught up yeah. with the big giants, I guess, in terms yeah. of green investment. It also has cracked, I guess, uh, in terms of a policy framework and tr that, that works, that ensures that the states also gains returns. So would you say that it is quite feasible to see actually China 
dethrone, as it were, the U.S. from a leading role when it comes to clean energy investments? Absolutely, and but we're already seeing that. I mean, we don't have to wait for, you know, Trump. <laughs> uh, that's already happening. I mm -hmm. mean, China is so, you know, from the sequestration that we, you know, experienced a couple of years ago in the U.S. government, the, the uh, you know, focus on austerity when China was actually, you know, increasing in investments, something like uh, more than a 100% increase in research and development over the last uh, mm -hmm. five to ten years, you know, that is already putting them really in the leadership position. And don't forget Europe, of course, which is continuing to obsess about running surpluses <laughs> and minimal deficits, you know, that's, that's very short-term thinking. So by investing in these new areas, and of course it's not just green, in the long run that increases your GDP, so your debt to GDP mm -hmm. ratio also stays, if you want, in control, even if your deficit in any given moment is high. So the U.S. government, when they you know, had their stimulus program in 2009, which was very green directed, their deficit went up to 10%. And a moment when Europe was obsessing about keeping it to basically zero. Yes. And we're seeing today the effect that that's had, positive effect that's had on U.S. recovery compared to Europe. And China very much at a global scale <laughs> is doing this across all their sectors. They are investing yeah. $1.7 trillion, trillion dollars in their you know, um, 2020 mm -hmm. strategy. And it's almost all green. I guess, if anything, Energy. China has already run ahead, uh, I guess, and especially with what in the long-term investments, absolutely. It already has. Yeah. Well, Mariana, thank you so much for joining us. Thank uh, you. And uh, do uh, keep up with the following chapters of the China Under Trump series. Thank you.